On Saturday, November 2nd, starting at noon, Kevin Williams is helping sick kids by playing video games. He needs your help to raise $1,000 for the Chio Foundation. Donate at extra-life.org slash participants slash 347-875. Camera, action! Cut! Cut! Welcome to Ropes to Reels, part of Wrestle Media, where everything is wrestling and wrestling is everything. I'm at Adam Conta. Drew Ferris is away this week. We actually had a whole thing planned out. Drew had picked out a movie, which we're going to get to a bit later on in the show. Well, I mean, I'm going to tell you what it is a little bit later on in the show. We're not actually going to do the full review because a really interesting thing happened to me on the way home tonight. I heard about a cool movie called 350 Days, and it just so happened that the director of said film, uh, Fulvio Cesare, decided that he'd give us an interview which is pretty cool. So we are going to spend a little bit of time talking to him, his experiences, meeting all of these legends of the ring and how it ended up turning him into a wrestling fan. It's a pretty cool interview. So stick around for that. But before we get there, I want to tell you all about our YouTube channel. Maybe you didn't know that we're on YouTube. And if you're the kind of person that likes to consume your podcasts through YouTube, well, we try to put out as many of these podcasts on our YouTube channel as possible. But we also have original video content like our road trip series. In fact, by the time you hear this, uh, we may very well have our latest YouTube video up where we are documenting our entire weekend uh, of Chinlock, Chinlock Wrestling. It was a lot of fun, and it's a pretty cool video as well. I'm pretty proud of it. So go check that out. And if you haven't yet, subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the little bell there for the notifications so you know exactly when we put out a new video. We'd really appreciate that. Those numbers could get a boost, so please do that for us. We would really appreciate it. We also want to let you know about our newsletter. We put one out for free every single week. And with that free new newsletter, you get all the updates on the latest and greatest happenings at Wrestle Media. What had some really cool content, our latest videos, and, of course, exclusive contests. We were giving away tickets to Chinlock 5. Now that that's over, we moved on to our new contest, where we're giving away a DVD copy of the brand new Trish Lita WWE compilation, Best Friends Better Rivals. You got to check this out. It's really cool. And you can only enter by subscribing to our newsletter. So do that right now over at WrestleMedia.ca. And then you get it for free. How great is that? Chance to win some free home video entertainment from WWE. Come on. That's great stuff. Just like this interview that we had with uh, Fulvio, who decided to come on board and tell, tell us all kinds of great stories about his time on the road, talking to wrestlers about their time on the road. Enjoy. I'm very proud to be on the line today with Fulvio Cesare. He is the director of the incredible documentary 350 Days, which is going to be screening for free, by the way, this Sunday in Toronto, a private screening at the Royal Theater 608 College Street from noon until four. Uh, Fulvio, thanks so much for joining us on Ropes to Reels today, especially since you just got back from Jersey with your dog. Uh, I mean, that's pretty incredible that you've been doing so much press for the film and yet you're still taking these road trips, although you have a very good reason for it. First of all, thanks for having me. And uh, yes, you're, you're right. Uh, I just drove in from New Jersey. Uh, it took me a little over nine hours. The traffic's pretty bad. But uh, I'm in Toronto right now, and uh, it's my latest on a kind of Thank You Canada tour. Um, my movie 350 days was released april 2nd uh, on itunes in the u.s and then a whole bunch of other platforms uh, you can get it on uh, amazon it's uh, available on um, a couple um, uh, cable platforms uh, xbox vimeo youtube a whole bunch of places but for some reason <clears throat> the amazon in canada works on a different uh, system it's a subscription-based thing so people can't get it in uh, Canada. You can still see it on Vimeo and Xbox and a couple other things. So I kind of took it upon myself to do a little tour of Canada because there's so much Canadian content in it. Uh, I had a lot of Canadian crew and the wrestlers that I interviewed. So I wanted to thank them and my way of promoting the movie and also just to travel throughout Canada. 
Plus, I mean, you know, th- this is a huge, huge hotbed for pro wrestling. Canadians are nuts about our wrestling. We love it. So anybody who's in the area and has an opportunity to see this show for free, by the way, go and do it. And if not, hey, you know, support Fulvio and this incredible film and go check it out on one of the platforms that he talked about. Let's actually talk a little bit about how this got started. Were you always a wrestling fan growing up? How did you kind of discover this crazy world that we love? Well, it's funny because that's always the first question. And um, I like getting it out of the way because, no, I was not a wrestling fan. I strictly came on board as uh, as a filmmaker because uh, I've been a, a, an actor for you know, 36 years now. And uh, the last few years, I st- I've been looking at other projects and yeah, you know, I directed a short film into like 20 film festivals into film school, the whole deal. So I was looking to kind of broaden the horizon, so to speak. But uh, this kind of fell on my lap. Um, I, I met her dad. It was his idea. He was a big wrestling fan and was friends with Mike Valentine. So uh, we, we had been working on these other projects anywhere. So he was like, what do you think of this idea? And just the fact that he was friends with Snooka and Valentine, I'm like, well, you you know, you already have connections. That's that's perfect. You might be onto something here. And so, you know, he had this whole idea about, you know, nobody's really talked about the territory days. So I started doing all my research and, you know, uh, watch as many documentaries as possible. And so what am I going to do? How is this going to be different than, you know, what's out there? I definitely don't want to do like a shoot video. So I really approach it as... Uh, a filmmaker uh, with these interesting people that I had no idea what they did or what it's about, but I knew there was a rabid, you know, base and fans. And so I jumped in, you know, head first and the very, very first weekend, you know, so I, I, I told him, I said, you know, you should let me direct this. I can call in favors and we can get this done. Let's just put a weekend together and let's see what happens. So the first weekend I got Tito Santana, Greg Valentine, Superstar Billy Graham and Angel was the uh, world's oldest living wrestler at the time. He was 99 years old. So that weekend was just gold. The very first person we interviewed was Tito. And I found out that his wife owned a hair salon in New Jersey. So, of course, I have to film him at the hair salon. (laughs) So here we are, you know, interviewing Tito about wrestling and there's little old ladies in the background getting their hair cut. And then we went from that to superstar and, you know, I really didn't know anything about him, but, uh, you know, but I did, I did remember the name and then, you know, he just starts, you know, talking and the, the candidness, the honesty, the, the no fear of any kind of, retribution or anything he just everything was like you know what does 350 days means mean to you well it means the promoter's taking advantage of you you know it means this it means that it's like and then he starts talking about how he never believed his his own hype and you know his uh gimmick and all that that he was strictly uh, about the you know the entertainment so it was kind of ahead of his time in a way and how you know in order to keep that uh, physique going he had to and then he just starts rattling off all this stuff about steroids. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This was steroids is usually controversial. It's like a big deal. And it's like, and he's just rattling it off like some laundry list. You know? And I'm like, okay, we, we definitely have gold here. These guys are being so open. There's nothing off the table. Uh, they're talking about, you know, the sex, the drugs, the rock and roll, the, uh, uh, the fight with fans. The, I mean, everything, nothing off the table. And, that was it. That first weekend, we're like, okay, well, we're on to something. And that led to 21 days and 72 interviews, uh, 38 of which made the cut in the movie. Clearly a whirlwind tour that you went on interviewing all these men and women. Why do you think that is that pro wrestlers in particular are so open and willing to give and be so vulnerable with the media and the public? Well, I mean, I, if you're talking about the new and current, that would be, you know, for promotion and uh, it's posterity. And so they have nothing to lose. If they, if they just sat down with me and, you know, it was all a rib or, you know, um, uh, they think I'm some kind of mark and they're just giving me some 
you know, silly stuff in, you know, in their gimmick, then it's pointless. There's no, there's no reason to make this documentary, but instead they felt this, I don't know. They just wanted to, either they trusted me to tell that, you know, I was going to tell their story, which was life on the road during the territory days. That's all it was. There was no, um, agenda. There's no Vince bashing. There's no, you know, oh, let's talk about the health care for athletes. None of that. It's like, what was your life like when you were, were a pro wrestler during the territory days? And that's what it was. It was missing your family. It was, it was drugs. It was steroids. It was adultery. It was, you know, getting into fight with fans. It was your car being destroyed because people uh, believed what you're doing was real. It was, uh, you know, getting shot. I mean, I can't tell you how many people I interviewed have actually been shot at. And they're wrestlers. They're not cops or soldiers. They're, you know, I mean, it's just crazy, crazy stuff. So I was just like really, really fascinated. And uh, I'm so grateful that they were so open and honest. And a lot of those wrestlers who got shot at would consider that a badge of honor because they felt like, hey, I was doing my job. I made them so mad that they wanted to literally kill me. That, well, <laughs> it's funny you say that because that's that is exactly true. I remember we have one guy, uh, Danny O'Hannon, in our uh, in our documentary, and somebody sliced him with a, a, a you know barber uh, razor. Oh my god! And he didn't know until he got back into the, the locker room, and he's bleeding. And you know, the other wrestlers are like, "Whoa, what the hell's happened to your arm? Look at that! And his bicep was sticking out, you know, because it had been cut." And he's like, "Well, I wasn't thrilled about that, but uh, he." I did my job. So, you know, if I'm a heel and, you know, I got them to that point, well, that was great. But, um, but obviously, you know, he would prefer not to have a, his bicep sticking out of his arm from a razor blade cut. <laughs> no doubt. Now, earlier you said that you weren't a wrestling fan when you took on the project. And now in this interview, you're throwing out words like heel and mark and gimmick. And you kind of do get sucked into the world very quickly. Pro wrestling oh, is very yeah. enveloping. So now, of course, I have to ask, now that you're done with the film, or at least done making the film and you're out promoting it, do you do you find that you would would you classify yourself as a fan now? Now that you've had a, your chance to immerse yourself in the world, well, well, I'll tell you what a fan I am now. That now I'm actually like you know rooting for Jericho and AEW, and <laughs> I, I know about New Japan, and and I had you know a whole bunch of Ring of Honor guys at my premiere in L.A. It's like Ring of Honor, but New Japan, what what's that? And now you know it's like. I, I know what it is. It's like, it's pretty awesome. And Chris Jericho is unbelievable. I did his podcast and he's been very, very supportive. He really enjoyed the documentary. Of it. You know, it's kind of amazing. You, you really came into a really great time of pro wrestling. Uh, I know some people would argue that certain products are not as good as they used to be, but in terms of, pure content availability you have companies from all over the world and they've never been more accessible which is a really really cool thing and so i hope a lot of fans get to check out the documentary that you've put together so that not only do they get to appreciate what we've got now but also how difficult it was back then you've had a chance to talk to a lot of these men and women who went through some pretty horrific stuff we talked about getting stabbed you know we've talked about the rampant use of, of drugs and 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 all kinds of other debauchery that was happening is there a particular story or something that you learned from your subjects on the documentary that completely floored you or you just you couldn't believe it to be true? Well, uh, so I, I would say, like, back to you know, getting shot stuff, um, like Don Fargo, for example, he had been shot just below the knee. But it, you know, fortunately, he says it was only a 22 or else, you know, it had been crippled for life. J.J. <laughs> uh, Dillon talks about um, people in the Maritimes in Canada with guns and shooting in the ring and actually in the auditorium getting shot at. And that, and to me, that's kind of really crazy because uh, I actually, you know, I don't usually talk about this, but I was a gunshot victim. I, I tried to stop a robbery when I was 17 years old. So I actually know what it's like to get shot and, you know, what that entails. But you wouldn't expect it to be, you know, from a wrestler. You would think, you know, a, a police officer, you know, a soldier, yes, of course, they get shot at. Wrestlers doing their jobs, I mean, that's just crazy stuff. And then, 
you know, the, the whole case they've been was pretty uh, interesting too, where they'd say, you know, the, the you know the, the heels and baby faces couldn't be seen together because you know they'd have to have a fight or you know because they'd have to really sell that when. In reality, they all drove together in the same van up to the auditorium, and then they went the different ways, you know. So just things like that, like you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say floored me, but it was like, wow, I just, I had no idea that that's what it was like. Now you and, obvi- sorry, go ahead. I was going to say the other thing is because I, I'm an actor, I, I completely get it. I, I see what they're doing. They, they are actors. They're actors, but they're they're athletes. Their uh, directors, their choreographers, their stuntmen—they they encompass all of that. So I, I mean, I'm just this is whole newfound respect for it. It's a, I, I, I had no idea. Now you've interviewed a ton of names in this movie. You already mentioned superstar Billy Graham, Bret Hart's in the film, Wendy Richter, Abdullah the Butcher. Uh, you mentioned Angelo Masca. The list goes on and on. There's so many incredible, talented legends in there. You said you had you could pull a few strings to get some access to these men and women. How were you able to get access to so many of these names? Well, it, it's it's funny you say that because uh, so like I said, the, the, the very very beginning we, we had access to a, a, a very few. We had um, uh, Snooker, Greg Ballantyne, Angel Savoldi. I think uh, Bill Eby was another one, but that was kind of it, right? And then I, I, I got Tito Santana. Uh, I wound up uh, meeting uh, George General Steele at a, at a, at a book signing. I kind of brought him on. Uh, I met Ox Baker at a convention, brought him on. My partners brought, uh, Ted DiBiase and Paul Warndorf on. Uh, and then, you know, as we started doing all this, when you start mentioning to people, well, you know, I interviewed, uh, you know, Ted DiBiase and Paul Warndorf. I said, really? Oh, this must be legit. And so they want to get on board. And, uh, and Brett, for example, I, I had met his brother Smith, who passed away. And he was the one who suggested that I, I talk to Brett and so on and so forth. And then when I did talk to him, I had mentioned that I interviewed Don Leo Jonathan. And I think that's what kind of, uh, did it for me and for him because he's like, you know, thank you so much for keeping his memory alive. And, you know, I appreciate that because he was so good and, you know, people have forgotten about him. I'm like, Holy, okay, I'm onto something here. You know, I mean, uh, here's Brett, you know, thanking me for doing this. And it's like, wow, this, this is great. It's really great. So it was kind of simple in a way because, you know, and then once Brett Hart, of course, everybody wants to come on board. Yeah, I mean, once you get basically the ball rolling on it, it's kind of like that old saying, uh, telephone, telegraph, tell a wrestler, right? <laughs> One wrestler right. hears about it, and then the next guy wants to be a part of it, and then the next guy wants to be a part of it. Now, you mentioned Bret Hart, and obviously he's a huge name in the world of professional wrestling, especially here in Canada. He's, he's the Wayne Gretzky of pro wrestling. And you got to spend quite a lot of time with him uh in fact i heard a story in an interview you did where you ended up spending a lot more time with him than you expected i i, I tell this story every single interview because it's just so unbelievable to me uh you know we, we had a series of about 10 questions that we asked everybody and he was just so great and so he knew everything you know off the top of his head i i, I literally had my interview in 20 minutes and then i said to him well you know now what do we do? Uh, you know, I did read your book. It's 450 pages. I have so many personal questions about it that I would like to ask. And he's like, well, I, you know, I got this appointment, but, um, yeah, we can resume. And we did. So I, I interviewed him for about eight, nine hours after that. My Straight, God. solid. I mean, like everything you can imagine from when he was a kid to high school to, you know, early stuff. It's just like, just crazy. He just kept going. And he, you know, he's just an encyclopedia of wealth, and I, and he's just such a great, you know, humble guy, and it was just so awesome. Yeah, most recently I had oh, a chance. And, and by the way, but by the way, I'd like to add that you know, one of the screenings I had was just this past week. I was in Edmonton and in Calgary, and uh, of course, so uh, the screening was to honor Brett, and we had a whole ceremony for him. We had somebody uh, playing guitar. Somebody gave him flowers. We somebody in our local artist that painted the, a portrait of him, gave him the, the painting. 
donated another painting which Brett signed that's going to a charity, uh, a prostate charity that he um, that he endorses. Then there's this uh, this this huge ceremony in in Calgary, uh, and I had never heard of it, but it's really really cool. It's called being white hatted, and it's something that's been going on since 1946. And um, you know it's it's given to dignitaries and celebrities. His father Stu had been white hatted. But Brett had never been white hatted. And so because I brought the screen to Calgary and it was like a big social event and all that, all three of us, Brett, his wife Stephanie and I got white hatted. It's just like the, the Queen has been white hatted. The, the George Bush, Vladimir Putin. I mean, it's like, it's crazy stuff. And we got white hatted that night. So it was a really tremendous, uh, past week. And here we are. And I'm going to try to top it off on, uh, on Sunday in Toronto. It's unbelievable all the things that you've experienced just on this tour alone. It's a little off brand, but I'd love to talk about your your recent trip to New York uh, for a Yankees game, and you ran into an an SNL star. How did that happen? <laughs> you mean Keenan? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He was he, he was just there. He's wait, waiting in line for a drink or something, and I'm like, Hey man, how are you doing? <laughs> it's like. It's New York, right? It's a Yankee game. Of course. Uh, you never know who you're going to run into. <laughs> I have to ask, um, who was somebody that you interviewed for the film that you were surprised at how well you got along with and had maybe had a little bit more in common with than you realized? Uh, you know what? I mean, I, no way I can pick one. I, I really felt comfortable with all of them. That There were, let's say, some more so than others, like like Brett, like um, like I really I can't speak highly enough of uh, Don Leo Jonathan. This guy was such a a Renaissance man. Uh, I was just blown away. I mean, not only was he like super super famous back in the '60s and '70s, but the guy was like when he retired from from uh, rest oh, and, and even before that, he was like a a judo champ. I think he lost in the Olympics by a point or something. Yeah. Um, he, he was a, um, a underwater explorer guy who was best friends with Jacques Yves Cousteau. <laughs> Him and his son helped make some of the suits for like underwater exploration. My he God. Was, he was a welder, like underwater uh, welder for like oil rigs. He, he's, he makes museum quality knives and the leather sheets that they go into. He was a big, uh, you know, safari hunter. I mean, this guy was like such an interesting, interesting man. I just loved talking to him. He, he was so fascinating. But but every every one of them, I, 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 the, the Wolfman in Toronto. I mean, I, I didn't know who he was. I'd heard about him. You know, people said, "Oh, you should interview him." And then when I looked into his history, it's like, wow. You know, Vince McMahon used to bring him into the ring with a, a chain and a, and a collar. Because, you know, he used to wear a, a, a wolf outfit, you know, over his head. And so he was so dangerous, you know, that could Vince have to have him in a chain and collar. And it's like, you know, people like, you know, loved him back then. Now nobody knows who he is. So I, just talking to him was just fascinating. I, I'm so glad that I got a chance to, you know, remind people who he was. Uh, Bill Eady, another encyclopedia of, of knowledge. And I definitely wanted him because he was a master. Um, wrestler, and that was really cool for me. I, I wish I had gotten some luchadores in there too. Um, but oh god, uh, George Animal Steel, another one. He was he was a teacher, so he knows so much about history, and but just fascinating to talk to. Uh, Greg Valentine, I'd say maybe is the one that when I first sat down with him, I thought, mm, I don't know if I'm going to get much out of him. He seems very serious, very stoic. And then once he started getting into it, he really opened up, and he's tremendous in, in the movie. He talks about all kinds of stuff, like you know, doing eight balls of cocaine with uh, Roddy Piper and drinking four cases of beer with uh, Ric Flair. Like, I mean, why would you say that? Are you saying you've done cocaine and you, you, drove, you drove drunk? I mean, that's you know, society frowns on that. It's like, yeah, I mean, that's that's what we did. That's what it was like. You, you know, I mean, so I I love the honesty, the candor, the just you know, it doesn't matter what what we did back then. That's that's you ask me what life was like on the road. That's what it was like. Do you think that 
part of why they're so cavalier about the whole thing is because pro wrestlers have always been seen as rebels and very, very much like rock stars. Well, they're definitely rock stars, definitely rebels. But I mean, you can, you can remember even when, you know, Vince was accused of, of doing steroids. I mean, what, what an uproar that was. And, you know, for them to like openly talk about it now as if it was nothing, I, I think that's quite the revelation. I mean, I, I don't, I don't think they would have talked about it. Like, I mean, people like, uh, like Schwarzenegger, let's say, like he, he never denied, uh, taking them, but they were legal at the time. But, you know, wrestlers, you know, like even, cause we, we asked about that and it was a big deal. Right? And so, Brett took them, Paul Orndorff took them, you know, all these guys took them, but back then, nobody thought they took them. So, they're just coming clean. I, I, I just love it. I want to ask a little bit about the title, because for those who may not be initiated, they may not know where that comes from, but it's a very specific um, title, and, I, and I'd just like to for you to kind of exposite on that a little bit. Yeah, well, it's funny because you know my that, that's it was uh, the title that my partner came up with, and he's like, "Look, they, all these wrestlers know." That's our first question. Yeah, ask him what 350 means to them, and they know. And what it means is that that's the amount of time that these wrestlers would wrestle a year, 350 days out of the year. And you know, sure, not every single one of them. Like even Brett, for example, he said, "Well, I didn't do 350, but you know, I did about 330." And then Bret Hart. You know, the champ, he's wrestling 330 times a year? That's crazy. You know, and all these other guys are saying, yeah, we'd have to go from one territory to the other where you're wrestling for $25, $30 a night, and you don't stay in the same territory because, you know, you go into the next one, you build some heat, you know, you beat up the, the next town champion, and then you move on, and, you know, you get buzz, and But that's what they did. They, they, they get up, and, you know, they travel 200 miles, but in between, of course, you know, the, the, the partying the night before, they got to get into the gym, there's drinking on the road to the next one, there's fights with fans, there's all of this stuff that happens in between. But, yeah, 350 days, and, you know, they talk about missing birthdays, and Halloween, and, you know, Christmas, and and the funny thing is, that this and this is one of the other reasons why I love Don Leo so much, I asked him, you know, 350 days, and he's, he started laughing. He's like, 350, the, the, those guys are slackers. I, I, I once wrestled <laughs> seven years straight without a day off. And Jeez. they would wrestle Thanksgiving and, like, Christmas, and they'd call those family days. Yeah. It's, it's crazy to think about how much these men and women had sacrificed. And, you know, speaking of women, I, I do want to quickly ask about Wendy Richter specifically. One of the shows we do here on Wrestle Media is Women Crush Wrestling. And I wanted to ask if she had a different perspective on things than some of her male counterparts, or did you find she was just one of the boys? Well, I, I, I don't know about one of the boys, but um, if you if you mean the, the love of the wrestling, then yes, absolutely. Uh, she's, she's so proud of what she did. As a matter of fact, she, she ran away from home because she said her father would never allow it, uh, that, you know, he, he wouldn't even allow her to get pictures taken. And, you know, the, the language he would use and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she's like, no, I'm not going to, I can't take this, not my life. So she took off and she became a wrestler. And she's so proud that uh, she was, uh, you know, WrestleMania 1 and the, the fabulous Moolah and the, the whole deal. So she she's really, really proud of it. And I think... I think she she did. I mean, she was a trendsetter. You know, the whole Cindy Lauper thing. I mean, that was a big, big deal in wrestling back then. No, no doubt about it. There's a lot of people who feel like she was just as popular as Hulk Hogan during that era, and I think there's a lot of evidence there that completely backs that up. Now, I want to talk a little bit about your most recent trip. You just got back from Jersey, but you had a partner with you, and I wanted to tell, uh, wanted okay. you to talk about your partner a little bit on this trip because obviously, uh, very important to you. Well, I can't, uh, I, the words do not, uh, explain the love I have for my partner. <laughs> um, she's my 94 pound, uh, pit bull mastiff. Uh, I'm her second rescue and, uh, I couldn't have gotten any luckier. I mean, she is just the sweetest, sweetest, largest thing. And, um, we've traveled so much together. We've done cross country twice. 
And what I like to do is I like to stop at uh, every state. You know, they have a, a welcome sign. Yep. So I, I, I don't know how many states I have. I must have good, about 30 of them that she's posing in front of. So this is just the latest trip. And she, she's, been, she's been everywhere with me. Hey, this is a commercial for Patreon.com slash WrestleMediaCA, where you can get early access to episodes of your favorite WrestleMedia shows, get full uncut and uncensored versions of your favorite shows, and more. Don't want to hear this commercial on your podcast anymore? Sign up at our main event tier and get these episodes ad-free. Want to hear your own commercial here instead of ours? We've got tiers for that, too. Visit Patreon.com slash WrestleMediaCA and join the WrestleMedia revolution today. There you have it. What an interview. If you've been listening to us for free at WrestleMedia.ca, you got a little taste of that full-length interview. But if you're one of our patrons, then you just got the whole shebang. Congratulations. Maybe you're listening to us for free at WrestleMedia.ca and you're thinking, wait a minute, I didn't know you guys had a Patreon. Well, we do. Patreon.com slash WrestleMediaCA. You can go there and put a few ducats in the bucket every single month and you'll get early access to these episodes. Or you'll get extra content from these episodes, like, say, the other half of a cool interview we had with a wrestling documentarian. Something to think about, right? Plus, you can get some of our episodes absolutely ad-free. And you'll get access to some of our exclusive shows just for our patrons as well. So give it a look over at patreon.com slash WrestleMediaCA. It is the best way to support us by throwing a few ducats in our bucket and helping us grow. Of course, we're also on social media. If you want to support us that way, you can like and follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And you can answer our question that goes along with this week's episode. If you could pick any legend out there today, who would you love to interview? Surely you have 10 questions for Bret Hart or Ted DiBiase or maybe Greg the Hammer Valentine or the Masked Superstar, Lex Luger, or or any of the plethora of legends uh, that our good friend Fulvio interviewed. Uh, Let us know. We want to hear about it. Finally, if you want to support us, rate and review us on iTunes. We love five stars, but it's not a Dave Meltzer system. So, you know, any stars that we get, uh, we'd love to hear your feedback, good or bad. We want to be the absolute best podcast we can be for you, our listeners. And your feedback really helps with that. If you enjoyed the podcast, share it with a friend, with a family member, with a stranger on the street wearing a wrestling t-shirt. Anybody who loves wrestling or movies, and especially those fans who love them together. Like they're chocolate and peanut butter. All right. Clearly I'm getting off track here. So let's wrap it up next week. Drew and I are going to be talking, uh, getting a little animated. Yeah. Because Drew's pick is, is, uh, well, it's animated. All right. Well, half of it's animated and half of it is live action. Drew has chosen Looney Tunes back in action. It's going to be interesting. I'm looking forward to it. I don't know how to feel about it. I've never seen the movie before, so uh, it'll be an interesting ride, that's for sure. And we invite you to come along with us on that ride. But until then, on behalf of WrestleMedia, I'm at Adam Kota. And on behalf of at Sir F Word, thank you very much for listening. And when it comes to this great interview with the director of uh, 350 Days, Fulvio Cesare, that's a wrap. This has been a presentation of Wrestle Media, where everything is wrestling and wrestling is everything. Here's what you're missing out on right now over at patreon.com slash WrestleMedia CA. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty heartbreaking. Um, you know, and I, and I might add that we, we were almost just had to sign, you know, the, the dot the I's and you know, you know, cross the T's and all that. We we were almost about to interview uh, Roddy Piper and he passed away. Want more? Sign up now at patreon.com slash WrestleMedia CA.